Okay, it's um, one o'clock, so I'll call to order the Green Mountain Care Board's hearing of uh, June 28th, 2023. Uh, we have a pretty stacked agenda today, um, so we'll have to stay on task. I am going to Vermont Medical Society this evening and have to drive to that, so we're going to have to stay, um, probably get up done by four o'clock so I can get over there. Um, we have uh, an update on the evolution of Green Mountain Care Board's hospital budget review process. That'll be presented by Tom Reese, uh, who's been working with our office, uh, and Sarah Lindbergh, our Director of Health Systems Finance. We'll have an all pair model update from the Agency of Human Services, and our uh, friend, Pat Jones, who is the Interim Director of Healthcare Reform at AHS. We'll also have an update on hospital sustainability and global payment model development from our Director of Health Systems Policy, Sarah Kinsler. And we'll have a Medicare only budget guidance and potential vote presented by health policy analyst, uh, sorry, advisor Julia Bowles. The ACO budget guidance uh, I've taken off the agenda for today. Uh, at last week's hearing, um, I think it was last week's, there was some uh, board member request for information relating to the benchmarking uh, that OneCare used for its executive compensation. The staff requested that information, and on June 26th, OneCare indicated that they would not provide it to the board, uh, and so we don't have the information that we wanted for uh, consideration of the benchmarking for guidance. I've sent OneCare a letter, and we'll soon be issuing a subpoena for the information that we requested. So that is off the agenda. We're going to put it on for July 12th. Um, so I'll turn to uh, Executive Director Barrett for her report. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have some um, scheduling announcements, public comment announcements, and then some updates for the board and the public. First, um, next week, we will not have a board meeting on July 5th. Happy 4th of July, everybody. Um, and as Chair Foster said, we will resume the next week on July 12th. Um, we've extended the public comment period for One Care Vermont's FY24 budget and certification guidance until July 11th at noon. And we're also accepting any public comments on the next Vermont all payer model agreement with the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation or CMMI. Um, we'll be hearing an update on that from Pat Jones today, um, but we do share any of those comments with um, our colleagues at the Agency of Human Services and the governor's office as they are leading those negotiations. You can find more information on any of our public comments on our website at gmcboard.vermont.gov. And then I have a couple of announcements. Um, first, I have an update on a recent submission, and then I am um, we'll be reading out a recent rate decision. So first, on May 31st, UVMHN sent us their proposal for the reinvestment of the $18 million into mental health programs. The board and the staff have reviewed the submission and the finance team are now developing a monitoring plan. I wanna thank the Department of Mental Health for their uh, collaboration and guidance to UVMHN on this project. Uh, in addition, the Vermont Psychiatric Survivors and the Vermont Chapter of NAMI, which is the National Alliance of Mental Illness, providers provided letters of support for that plan. Any um, documents in these letters can be found on our website under Hospital Budgets and the Enforcement Actions tab. And then lastly, uh, the board on May 11th, 2023, issued its decision and order approving modifications to the Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont large group rate filing. The decision and order are posted on the GMCV website under what's new and on our rate review website. So with that, I will turn it over to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and we'll take up the minutes from June 21st, 2023. Is there a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. Second. And any board discussion? All right, those in favor, please say aye. 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 And the minutes are approved. Um, I'll turn it over to Director Lindbergh. Um, but before I do, I just wanted to thank both you and uh, Mr. Reese for your work on this. This is something that we've spent a lot of time on 
and I've had the pleasure of working with both of you, as have all the other board members, and it's been, for a new board member, extremely informative to understand how we have done it historically and to get to work with you guys on the new approach, which I think is really great. So thanks for all your diligence and your time educating all of us. Um, I, I greatly appreciated it. Um, Director Lindbergh. Good afternoon. Uh, are folks able to hear me and see the slideshow? Wonderful, all right. Always the easy stuff that can be the hardest. So I'm joined, as uh, <laughs> Chair Foster said, by Mr. Reese, uh, who will uh, you'll get to hear from directly a little bit later on in the presentation today. But we wanted to take a little time to update you on how the um, process for evolving our regulation of hospital budgets is evolving, uh, which is very much a work in progress. But we're here to share some learning with you all. Uh, so the overview of what we'll go through today, a very brief history about hospital budget regulation in Vermont's uh, past, as well as how we're trying to enrich that historical approach with um, evidence-based techniques, and then giving you a demonstration of how this might um, really be implemented in our regulatory process. So uh, in 1992, which feels a lot sooner than it actually is to me, I'm getting to be that <laughs> demographic, uh, the Vermont Healthcare Authority was formed. And what that uh, organization did is merge the health data, the health policy council and the health data councils, as well as the certificate of need review board, um, which uh, only lasted a few years before it was uh, coupled with the Department of Banking, Insurance and Securities, uh, which became BISHCA. Uh, so fun fact uh, is uh, when people talk about the HCA, uh, like anything in Vermont, you have to be careful which uh, which HCA they meant. Uh, but this is when the rubber really hit the road for Vermont in terms of the fact that that's when the authority to um, limit hospital budgets came into effect. So that's when the state not only could collect the data, review it, but actually do something about it. So uh, the Green Mountain Care Board was formed in 2011, and that's the time when Bishka was renamed to the Department of Financial Regulation. And so hospital budget decisions for fiscal year 13 onward um, have been the responsibility of the Green Mountain Care Board. So why would we bother to regulate hospital budgets? Um, well, if you look at this uh, uh, tree map, you can see that nearly half of the spending in Vermont is happening at hospitals. So in 2019, there were $6.8 billion spent on healthcare in Vermont, and 3.1 billion of that uh, was at our, um, I'm sorry, million, yeah, 3.1 billion of that was at hospitals. Obviously, there's many other drivers um, of healthcare expenditures, but it is a big bucket. Um, and because Vermont has such a highly concentrated market, not just for hospital services, but also for health insurance, uh, regulation is an essential tool to help uh, uh, help markets that don't have competition to help keep them healthy. Um, and uh, when we say monopoly here, uh, we know that over half of the care is uh, centered in, at uh, the UVM Medical Center. Uh, the network more broadly is up to closer to 60%. So um, when we say monopoly, it just means a bunch uh, is concentrated in one organization. So um, it's an important uh, factor in any regulatory process to know what your market looks like. Uh -huh. I'll also say that some of these buckets, unfortunately, are very vexing for us all, such as that drug bucket. Um, that's when I think that um, the whole country is really uh, grappling with. Um, so hospitals are one where we might be able to exert some leverage. Uh, so to date, most of the regulation in the state of Vermont has used has been based on revenue. Uh, the regulatory approach specifically is limited net patient service revenue, which you'll hear me call NPR mostly, but if I remember, I'll say NPSR. Um, and that focus might have some unintended consequences. Um, so NPR changes for lots of reasons. It can go up or down uh, from volume. Say you have a global pandemic and people can't go show up, you know, that will have an effect on NPR. Uh, your payer mix will have an effect. So if you happen to live in a community that serves more folks that have a governmental payer or maybe not a payer at all, that's going to look a lot different than someone who um, has uh, commercial folks uh, more broadly represented in their payer mix. 
service mix can also affect NPR. So uh, if you were to move to uh, a less expensive mm -hmm. or a service that had less of a margin um, or conversely, something with a higher margin, that can affect your NPR, um, such as the, and, and the intensity of new care uh, might affect your NPR. So establishing the, a CART-T program, for instance, which is a, a real benefit to patients, will also increase NPR because of the costs associated with that. Um, price is probably the one that you f think about the, the most. So that's the actual uh, reimbursement rate uh, that uh, is associated for services. So that's another reason that NPR might change. Um, and then just, you know, the, just your infrastructure. So if you acquire or get rid of a practice, that's also going to change your, your net revenue. Um, so it's hard to narrow in, I think, on the things that regulators are most interested in by looking at revenue alone. So that's why, as we think through trying to evolve some of this and add to it, uh, we wanted to think about, well, what's changed since the Green Mountain Care Board was formed? And turns out quite a bit. <laughs> uh, I don't know if you remember the Affordable Care Act uh, or Obamacare, as some people know it, but that really did dramatically change uh, the market here in Vermont and nationally. Uh, a growth in multi-state networks, uh, as our speaker series uh, talked about, um, some of these larger um, programs are um, potentially using some market power to affect uh, their negotiating power. Um, and in Vermont, we see not only the UVM health network being established with ties to New York, but we also see Dartmouth um, having some hospitals here in state too. And so um, the fact that patient care patterns don't respect state lines gets even more complex when the corporations don't either. Uh, we also saw the establishment of three accountable care organizations, of which of which only one remains, uh, again, Vermont-based. Uh, and then, of course, the global 19 uh, pandemic, COVID-19 global pandemic uh, really has changed our world in a lot of ways. But I think in the healthcare sector, it's being felt extremely acutely even today. Um, so, you know, I, we think that, you know, just looking at revenue or that revenue based regulation really was, you know, a part of a different time and, and very different circumstances than we're facing today. And with the advent of more data availability and our ability to harness that, we think that we have the um, some new capabilities to take advantage of that. Um, and I think one other advantage of looking, um, you know, more explicitly at the revenue side of things is that there can be cases where, there might be a one-time expenditure um, that affects a budget and we might, by going budget to budget revenue, we might be um, losing the thread on some of those expenditures. So just trying to uh, really narrow in on really what is driving these, uh, these uh, expenses and understanding those better. And so I'm very fortunate to have had the pleasure to work with uh, Mr. Tom Reese, who's had a lot of experience and I'll let him speak to some of that now and uh, help you uh, hear some of what I've learned from him about his recommendations for our path forward. Thank you, Sarah. Um, let me preface my comments by extending my deep appreciation to the board for all that they are doing in in wrestling with a new approach to their responsibilities um, and in trusting me with a, a portion of that responsibility. Um, I think it's it certainly is a capstone for a long career that I've had, and and I think um, that career serves pretty serves us pretty well as we look to to take a very different approach. Um, I, I don't want to spend a lot of time on on the experience underneath this. I tried to encapsulate um, a couple of bullet points of uh, of specific interest. Um, was educated at Delaware and have a master's in, from the program in health and hospital administration from the University of Florida. Um, but I really started my career here. I was born here. I was actually born at the old Fletcher House. Um, that's a long time ago. Um, and started my career at the Medical Center Hospital of Vermont under the tutelage of, uh, of Dan Olson, um, a career that uh, ended several years ago with uh, a senior management position at the uh, Geisinger System. Um, after that career as an executive, I've spent 26 years consulting basically with 
with three different uh, types of uh, healthcare providers, um, much of the time with academic medical centers. Um, recently, a lot of time with Ascension Health Hospitals as we have been doing performance improvement projects for them and uh, spent a lot of time with community medical centers around the, around the country. Over the last 20 years, I've really worked in the space of financial data and its relationship to health outcomes and their relationship to healthcare performance, um, both as a member of, uh, of several teams working to, to alter hospital financial trajectories, but also working with many hospitals on issues of uh, improving both clinical quality and cost effectiveness through the utilization of expense data, um, specifically expense data at two levels. One is the departmental level and the second is at the, at the actual patient level. And all of those things are coming together for us, I think, in, in a, a very robust way. And we'd like to talk to you a little bit about um, the, the six, um, six domains that we think are important for the board to be conscious of, cognizant of, and to measure to, um, and just briefly walk, walk you through those domains because they will become very important to us into the immediate future. Um, and, and those dom domains are really driven by data uh, available to us in Medicare cost reports, um, which have uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 45 discrete elements that are much too cumbersome for us to work with. But one of our first efforts working in partnership with Sarah was to, to really hone down on six characteristics that we can we can view as being specific to things that are important to the board. So Sarah, could you give me the, the that next slide, please? Um, so, so there are, are really six domains that I think are important to us. One is, is how patient complexity, how sick, sick are hospitals patients. And uh, by not looking at that, we miss an opportunity to start weighing the value each individual hospital brings to, to us and to its patients. Um, the foundational standard for measuring uh, the patient complexity in a hospital has been established through the Medicare program. It's called the case mix index. And each uh, MSDRG, um, of which there are now 996, have its own case weight. And those case weights rates vary from, from minimally, um, a little over one, to more complicated, um, and I think the most complicated is a heart transplant, which is a, 19, uh, a 19, to give you a relative range. Um, but, but when those are all rolled together, they provide a, an average case rate weight for each hospital in the country. And they're all driven by the same factors, and thus we have a way to to actually look at the severity of patients in every hospital and, and compare those to one another. So, so it is a gold standard of patient severity. Well, the next slide, which is, which is a similar Medicare-based standard, which I have always used as the gold standard for hospital financial efficiency um, which is, in, in fact, um, the Medicare cost per case um, risk adjusted. And, um, and many hospitals that I've had the pleasure of working with actually have for a number of years managed their costs to Medicare costs um, uh, and relying on other payers to, to provide them some level of uh, satisfactory uh, profit. Um, 
uh, spent a lot of time, as I said, with Ascension Health Leadership, um, who actually now use managing to Medicare as one of the performance standards for their CEOs in their 21 hospitals around the country. Um, a, a third standard that we have created ourselves, which is uh, interestingly, uh, the ratio of administrative and general service salaries to clinical salaries. Um, it's a, a field from the Medicare cost reports that are available to us. And when we started to evaluate these, we saw considerable variation in what these relationships look like. So we've decided that it's an important uh, indicator of discretionary investment in services that are and purchase of human resources that the, each hospital administrative team um, takes under their advisement. So it is a it is a means for us to look at uh, how hospitals are spending um, and uh, what their priorities are in their spending patterns. Next slide is um, EBITDA, which is uh, a very clear me measure of financial operating performance. But it's pretty clean definition of financial operating performance um, because there are variables taken out of the normal evaluation of performance, which, and this just focuses on pure operations um, without extraneous um, accounting manipulation of those operations. And that gives us another way to compare across hospitals in a pretty consistent fashion. Um, the, the fifth factor is um, cash for operations, um, critically important to the board um, as you look at sustainability. And, and we certainly have some some pressure points in our system um, relative to sustainability and uh, and thus we are recommending and bringing to you um, a gold standard of of cash for available for operations um, and that's all cash available for operations as opposed to simply um, days cash on hand um, they are two very different things and we can extract those from Medicare cost reports. And finally, um, one of the most complicated, um, you might think it's simple, but it's not uh, simple at all, is how do we measure quality? Um, there are dozens and dozens of measures of hospital processes that are indicative of quality, um, but they're very, very hard to compare. And in actuality, many years ago, I had the deep pleasure of looking and working with Uwe Reinhardt, who is probably the now passed away, but the, the dean of uh, medical economists in the world. And we had these discussions relative to looking at the performance of efficient physicians from a cost perspective versus physicians who spent more money on patient care. And uh, the conversations with Uwe settled on the fact that the, the quality, the absolute quality of a hospital is, did the patient survive and go home or did the patient pass away during their hospital stay? It's a standard measure. It's available out of Medicare. It's a pretty, very high level, a lot of factors go into that measure, but it's a high level gauge for the level of quality a hospital provider is delivering. So those are the six standards that we think are important. Um, we are going to use those standards to compare Vermont hospitals with peers. Um, as you may remember, we have structured four peer groups, um, one of critical access hospitals, um, one of small rural hospitals, um, one of mid-sized rural hospitals, and then one of academic medical centers. And with the academic medical centers, we have used several cuts of uh, profiles so that we understand 
more the dynamics of uh, the, the university compared to other types of the, uh, peer, peer groups. Um, so given all that, we wanted to bring back to you a little example of what power we believe these statistics bring to the board as they, they deliberate um, their actions uh, into the future. Um, I've got to thank um, Tom Walsh for, for driving us to this example. Um, it was Tom's brainchild and, and we worked together to, to profile the brainchild. But his request was, give me two similar hospitals with, with different structures so that we could demonstrate what happens with additional information. So here we have two hospitals that are about the same size. Uh, they certainly are the, the same, as close as I could come up with. Um, length of stay, occupancy are about the same. As you will see, they have very different mixes of in and out patient revenue. One is very concentrated on an outpatient side. The other is kind of split between in and out patients. Um, uh, there are not, uh, it's not unusual to see an academic medical center with the split of the hospital on the left, um, but there are others that are very concentrated with inpatient services. Um, and there is, of course, uh, um, uh, if we go to the next slide, there is uh, a substantial difference in the in the outcomes that these hospitals are producing. Um, hospital one has a has a negative bottom line and. Uh, uh, driven by an operating high operating loss, um, it also is now in a position where it's really low on cash, uh, um, and um, but they seem to be collecting money at the same rate as their as their counterpart, who is actually um, generated some net income. These are 2021 data, uh, by the way. Um, much of that was supported by COVID monies, um, generated a really good EBITDA, um, and has a lot of cash on hand. Um, so the question becomes, if, if these two hospitals approach the board and ask for a 5% rate increase, um, the tendency, I think, um, based on my observations of the board uh, now and in the past, was um, uh, it's likely that the board would be concerned about the sustainability of the hospital one and um, probably give them the benefit of the doubt and help um, offset that by approving uh, a larger rate increase than hospital, hospital two. But if we look at um, some additional factors um, and the gold standard factors, we see uh, suddenly see that hospital one is taking care of patients who are a little less ill. They're costing a lot more. Um, they are using uh, discretionary costs to spend on administration versus clinical affairs. Um, the EBITDAs, as, as we have shown them, are very different and the cash on hand is very different. Um, and their Medicare deaths um, are also different. So that that perhaps Hospital One is taking care of less sick patients with uh, not as good results as Hospital Two. And how would that affect our decision in, in investing into their future um, by granting them rate increases and and thus we diff have a different decision. We now have a decision of, wow, hospital two really needs to be um, encouraged to keep driving that performance forward versus hospital one, which we need to have asked some questions about well, what are you doing with your discretionary spending and 
and why aren't you achieving the results that um, your peer hospitals are able to achieve? Um, so in summary, we can, um, I think this is a rhetorical question for me, but I, I do believe evidence-based expense analysis um, will change the way we think about rate increases because we'll have much richer information to deal with and much richer conversations to discuss with our hospital leaders. Um, I, I guess I would close by saying using an expense base establishes a new language for us to communicate with hospitals um, and for hospitals to communicate with their medical communities and amongst themselves. It's a common language. Uh, there, it's a, it's created by Medicare. It's created off of Medicare cost reports, and so uh, we can. There are very nuanced pieces to the language, but the language is standard, and I think it will allow us to communicate in a much more finite way with uh, with the hospitals into the future. I want to move to the last side, Sarah, and we can move to questions. Sure. Yeah. Um, I'll just wrap my piece by saying that um, you know these are the metrics that we'll be looking at as part of the hospital budget review process uh, this uh, this summer. Um, and this bridge year, I see as an opportunity for us to really be curious, learn. Uh, no data are perfect. Uh, there's going to be a lot to learn. We want to be really responsible with this information. Um, and figure out how we can effectively and efficient, uh, efficiently try to incorporate these types of measures into a standard, predictable, but evidence-based regulatory practice. Um, so, you know, I think it's important to say that these, in and of themselves, um, are, are information. It, it's not um, a me measures that are designed um, for regulatory decision making in and of themselves, but it can help round out the picture. And it's, you know. Cost reports um, are far from perfect, but they're the best thing that we have to really put ourselves into context. And now we have kind of some more acumen to really just take a closer look at how we're doing compared to similar hospitals. So uh, with that, how what can we address for you this afternoon? Well, thank you both very much. <clears throat> um, I'll open it up for board member question or comment if members Lunger Holmes have anything. I do have a couple questions, um, so I'll go ahead and jump in. Um, on slide, can we go back to slide 11, please? I don't seem to see slide numbers. Uh, oh, it, it's this one, ratio of admin. Gotcha, thanks, so, sorry. I had a question. <laughs> I had them in there at okay. one point. <laughs> That's okay. Um, the, so I had a question about this metric. Um, as I think most folks know, most of our hospitals are the fiscal intermediaries for the blueprint for health community health team. So those dollars run through the hospital's budget. And we have over time seen some increased investment around care management, delivery system transformation. And I'm just curious how that fits in, like where this that falls in this metric. Um, and that's coming from knowing that uh, in the medical loss ratio world, in the insurance world, um, part of what the feds did when they looked at the federal medical loss ratio was ensure that they were carving out uh, care management expenses because otherwise uh, that's typically in the admin. So, um, and I think if we want hospitals to transform and we're thinking about those kinds of dollars as a good thing, but they're in the admin part that would increase the, you know, the admin component compared to clinical. How do we think about that? Um, and how do we make sure that we don't have an unintended consequence of creating a disincentive to invest in those types of uh, clinical transformation dollars, which technically are admin? A wonderful com uh, a comment, and uh, thank you for that, Robin. Um, my res my response is uh, we're talking a new language, and that new language I think will allow us to communicate more effectively and efficiently with hospitals. 
So all of these standards are simply standards, uh, measurement standards, and and uh, provide the board with an opportunity to have conversations above and beyond those standards. So if if a hospital has a has in this particular ratio something that seems to be a little different, I think the board will want to ask them about what that difference is. And if the, they come, the, the hospital and its board comes back and says, yeah, but we're investing in care management, we're investing in some additional patient service investments, then that makes changes the arg argument and we all get educated by, by that. But we, it's not a standard that we're going to say, oh, well, you're out of control and we're just going to walk away from that. But up, on the other hand, if we find um, through this standard that there's uh, some really strange um, investments being made in, in one area or another, then likewise, we can have those conversations. Yeah, and I'll just add another factor in this bucket uh, that's top of mind for me is that uh, this will also be really sensitive to the corporate structure of the hospital. So if a hospital has stuff in like a shared service organization or something, that's really going to distort this. So that's exactly the type of learning that I'm trying to do and um, evolve our data models so that we're wrapping our mind, our arms around the full labor expenses um, as those, you know, due to accounting um, and reporting differences uh, that we're not able to do as successfully as I'd like. So, um, you know, I, I agree like that, that there's, uh, you know, anytime you kind of <laughs> get new data, it seems like you also have new questions. Um, so it'll be a process, but yeah, very excellent point. As, as we move past that, and I think it's an, a very important um, for the board to, to understand how we view this as a, as a shared process, we are extending to hospitals once, the, once they see their comparator hospital groups, which they will within the next month. Um, we are extending to each CEO the opportunity to come back to us and say, oh, I'd like to see these other five hospitals included in that in that comparative group. And we're very open to that. We, we haven't got this perfect. Um, um, and so we want it to be a collaborative process as we start evolving it. Great, thank you. Uh, that's that's super helpful. I just wanted to think through, you know, people tend to hear admin as bad, right? But some yeah. some admin is uh, tra care transformation and the direction that we hope to move in. Um, then on the Medicare per deaths as a percentage of discharge, I, um, I was just wondering a little bit about this, uh, just because in thinking about our current uh, quality metrics and the all-pair model uh, agreement and that quality framework, I, I don't think, and I did not go back, and I did not have time to check, so I could be wrong. Uh, this was one of our metrics. So I was just curious about choosing a metric outside of our current measure set um, and whether this is a measure we should think about moving forward. Um, it, as, you know, as you know, we're working on the global budget uh, methodology and whether we should be thinking of this as a possible uh, metric in that context or not. Um, you know, me measures don't always have to be exactly the same, but there, at least in this state, has been a lot of work statewide on ensuring that there's a robust conversation around metrics and making sure that we're not constantly just adding and that we're cognizant of the administrative burden that that brings when folks are trying to focus their work on their, based on the, what they're being measured on. Uh, um, thank you for uh, that question. And it, uh, part of it harkens back to conversations a long, long time ago with Uwe. But in essence, there are also are important process measures that, that we are all working on and and certainly Medicare is working on them and they end up uh, for for non-critical access hospitals, they're ending up with a broader distribution of 
quality process scores. Um, and so the decision on whether to use this particular standard, uh, Robin, is, uh, I think, up to people who are thinking uh, collaboratively with hospitals about these metrics. This metric can be pulled right out of Medicare very, very easily. Doesn't no requirement to put additional resources into this from a hospital perspective, and it just gives us just gives us a, a, a bit of insight. It doesn't give us great insight. And if there's a quality issue that we think exists, we probably would want to explore other other quality measurements from a process perspective with those hospitals to see what we can do to help them improve. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just add that um, we're fortunate uh, to have uh, experts here at the board uh, collaborating with the Vermont Program for Quality and other partners um, to come up with a broader framework uh, for assessing quality in our healthcare delivery system, as well as uh, narrow in on kind of which might make sense for an accountability standpoint, particularly as it might relate to any sort of uh, budget exercise. So this is certainly not meant to be exhaustive nor to ignore that, that critical body of work. So um, duly noted. <laughs> Thank you both. Thank you. I just have one question for you, um, and I really just want to say I really appreciate the expense-based approach uh, that we're going in and the addition of some of these new metrics. I think they'll enhance our ability to analyze budgets, and I think they're going to shine some interesting lights on on uh, the submissions this year. I think my my only question really is, are there data, is there a data source available that would allow us to compare uh, cost per adjusted case for commercial patients, not just Medicare. Um, you know, I think there's a fairly extensive literature pointing to price as a driver of expenditure growth. And since hospitals don't really have a leverage over Medicare prices as a reimbursement, but they do have leverage over commercial prices, I think there could be hospitals that could be low on cost per Medicare case and actually high on cost per commercial case depending upon their, you know, the market concentration, bargaining leverage, other factors. So I think that would be an additional metric that would be really helpful to have. And I wondered if there was a data source um, availability of that information and what your yeah. thoughts on the list of, of Yeah, um, the, the cost reports aren't perfect, <laughs> but it does allow us to um, back out the federal program. So uh, Medicare and Medicaid uh, uh, costs and expenditures. Uh, so. Uh, or on um, utilization on the inpatient side. So we'll have some ways to start getting at that, but uh, I think that's you know the type of uh, work we're still working to extend for fiscal year 25 and beyond. But yeah, to <laughs> uh, Tom, unless I'm th not remembering any uh, data sources that could solve this problem magically. Boy, I hope you, I'm glad you had an answer because I didn't really have an answer to that because uh, I am not uh, as, familiar with that dynamic within the cost report that as you are um, and I will come back Jessica to you and and say that through all my work with Ascension who drives to Medicare as their management objective and they drive that so that they can set their costs commercial costs um, to generate their margin. That's it's a pretty simple technique for them. Um, and they execute it pretty well, actually. Yeah, I think that's why we want an understanding of what's happening in that, in that drive. <laughs> okay, that's my only question. Thank you so much, both of you. Um, I had two quick ones. Um, I really appreciated Member Holmes's question. If we can somehow suss out and get a direction on that, because we are such an outlier nationally on our Medicare costs, that it could be a little bit um, deceiving and, of course, doesn't take into effect market power by various places. I don't know if there's a way to do it based on um, the reimbursement data we have for commercial as a, by reference to uh, Medicare and sort of at least roughly directionally get a sense maybe. Um, so I'll put in a plug for Member Holmes' suggestion. And the other question I had was for the care transformation dollars that may be in administrative costs for our hospitals, 
do we have that quantified now or can we get that is is that something we have See? yeah we have that revenue uh broken out separately uh in our current uh data model yep we have the blueprint revenue but if there's other investments that they've made i don't know if, do we have that too uh, so we have what comes into the hospital as revenue related to other types of revenue that aren't NPR. Um, what we don't have much granularity on is uh, the expenditures that are supporting the communities. And I think that's an essential point. And hopefully we can get a better sense of the types of infrastructure our hospitals are supporting that uh, might be more of a dotted line um, in terms of kind of corporate structure. <laughs> I love this conversation because we're talking the language. We now are talking the language. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Tom. Um, then the other question I had, you know, in those hospital one versus hospital two, I think, you know, just by how you analyze it, you do come to a different conclusion. I mean, I went through this and sat and said, okay, we got to give hospital one more money. And then the way we do it now, it's like, well, hospital two is performing really well. We want them to have more money to to be continuing to do such a great job for Vermont. So I thought it was really interesting just to see the the way we look at it and come to very different conclusions. Um, and some of I wonder, so what happens to hospital one if you say, okay, just in this hypothetical and realizing it might not be reality and there might be nuance. But if you say to hospital one, no, you're not performing at the level you want, and we are going to give the money to hospital two. What happens to hospital one? My off the cuff response to that, and I have a short sleeve shirt on, so it's not a big cuff. Um, my off the cuff response to that is you say to hospital one, we're really concerned. And we sh we have we share your concern, um, and we're going to have to talk about what operational improvements you're going to make over the next twelve months, in order for us to support uh, increase in your in your funding. Um, I think there's a quid pro quo to do uh, to take with that hospital in this case, um, Chairman. Yeah, great. Um, okay, I'll. Turn it to the healthcare advocate for any questions or comment they may have. Chair Foster, this is Susan Barrett. I forgot to tell you that the healthcare advocate is unable to make the meeting today. They had oh, um, a scheduling conflict. I'm sorry about that. No, that's fine. Um, I probably should know. I should have figured that out. I think that there might have been an email. Maybe I missed part of it or didn't read it closely enough. Um, all right. Uh, I'll turn it to public comment via the raise the hand function. Mr. Davis, how are you? Please go ahead. Uh, Mr. Chair, Ms. Uh, Chair, thank you very much. Uh, I, have a, I have a comment and a question. Um, I've been involved in this for a long time. Uh, the, in 1991, um, I, my bill was the first hospital control bill that existed in Vermont, passed the House but not the Senate, but it got picked up in 1995. We saw that. That's where that would fit on Sarah's, uh, I, in Sarah's uh, slides. I believe that based on that background, my watching at this time, I think this movement, this uh, project, whatever you want to call it, is uh, one of the, the single most important one that we, one of the single most important ones that we've ever had. Um, it's the, and I think if it's, it, it's absolutely essential, I think, to really get, get this problem solved is to is to make this make this work i think it's just we we we've got to we've got to make this work um that's my comment my question is this for tom uh reese i i'm i'm curious uh whether in you for based on your judgment i know it's you, you may not have a full answer yet but i'm very interested in your experience here if you shift from ebitda to if you shift from um, days cash on hand to EBITDA, uh, do you expect to see, should we expect to see a, a significantly different way to look at what's going on now? Uh, the, how, how important in your judgment is that shift? Because if you look at, for example, the 60% of the system, um, which is the UVM health network, 
their day's cash on hand is terrible. And, um, and, and so, uh, and so that, so that's, that's my question. Can you, I know I, you may not have the data yet, but I'd, I'd be interested in your experience here. Thank you. Um, the, the relationship between EBITDA and, and cash, of course, is, is, is is close but not exact, um, and uh, I think it's it's important uh, that uh, for the board we look at uh, all sources of cash. We don't look at just um, days cash on hand, which is one metric, but but there are a lot of hospitals that have a lot more cash than they have. Uh, dedicated to days in cash, and and many of those are reserve funds that the board has reserved for for the future, but are actually available for for operations. So, so while there's a a relationship, it's not a dollar for dollar relationship, and and we I think need more time to evaluate those relationships over the over the spectrum of hospitals we're working with. Thank you, sir. Any other uh, public comment? Oops. Mr. Del Treco, I saw you come yeah. on off camera. Yeah. If you got, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I. <laughs> thank you, Chair Foster. I've been having a problem raising my hand. Um, Just showing up's hey, okay too. Yes. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Um, so, uh, Sarah and group uh, and Tom, I um, good to see you again. I appreciate the simplicity of this. Um, my thinking um, was uh, somewhat aligned with um, board member lunges around um, the quality piece. You know, we've always in Vermont been a little bit concerned about a mortality rate because of the small end. I'm not saying that's right or wrong, but that's been a little bit of the thinking in the past. So as we evaluate that, it um, will be important to, to, to sort of uh, figure that out a bit. Um, I think the uh, Medicare cost report, I don't I don't know if how many have filled it out. I filled it out with a pen and paper and did step down <laughs> by hand, uh, understand lines through one through 23, whatever they are. Um, you know, administration, uh, to Robin's point, is an interesting uh, concept um, because uh, the Medicare cost report is structured a uh, worksheet A, which includes all of your expense activity. Are we talking before pre pre reclasses, uh, post A adjustments? What lines are we including in administration? And and you know, maybe even a bigger point is electronic medical records, um, a huge hog. That's considered administration uh, in general. Uh, there is one line item that is tagged to line five, which is called administrative in general. Um, the other line items that are called administrative in general, you could almost there's a there's an interesting line in the in that slide. It's called direct. Um, there's pharmacy uh, when pharmacy dispenses uh, meds to a patient that's administrative in general. Is it indirect or direct? Medicare calls it indirect. So there are these nuances that we need to sort of evaluate and figure out what's included, what's not included. Um, and I'm particularly interested in the comparison piece because that's, um, that's critically important, especially when you consider uh, the makeup of um, employed physicians in Vermont that do sit on our Medicare cost reports, where many of these other external systems have um, employment arrangements that sit in separate corporations. So what do we compare to? How do we understand those expenses? We're, you know, a whole sort of set of nuances. Um, so um, that leads me to the, I guess, the surprise moment for me, that this is the 2024 sort of process. Um, or part of that. Um, so I think we need to be um, have some awareness uh, around that. And um, and then and then the other thing is, what year of cost report are we using? An audited cost report, a filed cost report. Um, 
you know, the last audited cost report is probably 2021, maybe ish. Um, so those are some interesting things that um, I think about. Cost reports certainly, as I think you've said more than once, Sarah, are interesting tools, sometimes right, sometimes not right. Uh, and we get into all this um, um, uh, potential confusion. And uh, again, I appreciate the simplicity. Just want to be aware of some of the moving parts. Thank you. Thank you for the comment, Mr. Del Treco. And I good points. I think that that's something that Director Hillenberg is very aware of. So I'm glad that you've cited those and that we'll definitely work to make sure we get them right. Um, Thank you. Yeah, of course. Um, any other public comment? Great. OK, well, Mr. Reese and Director Lindbergh, thanks so much for all your work on this. It's been impressive and um, a joy to work with you both on this. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Good luck, Pat. <laughs> she used to have this job. <laughs> <laughs> um, next, we'll be hearing from um, Pat Jones, who's the interim director of healthcare reform at AHS on the all pair model update. Um, for those of you who don't know Ms. Jones, she did used to work here. She's a dear friend to many of us and one of the most enjoyable people to work with in government. And I really value the friendship and collaboration she's given all of us and, and taught us, taught me a lot. Um, so, Pat, thank you for being here and um, take it away. Great. Um, thank you for those kind words and um, especially thank you for the chance to come and present an update on the all-payer model work to the board and to the public. Um, so as Chair Foster said, I'm in a new role as interim director of health care reform for the Agency of Human Services. Next slide. So um, what I'd like to do today is um, provide a brief overview of the current um, all-payer model agreement, go into a little detail on where we are, and then um, talk about what we can share um, in terms of the future um, potential multi-payer model with the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation and CMS. So the current model, as um, I think most people know, has three signatories, the governor, the HS secretary, and the Green Mountain Care Board chair. And a full uh, GMCB vote was required in order for the chair to sign this agreement. The original period was um, from 2018 to 2022, so encompassing five um, performance years. We are currently in the first year of a two-year extension period, um, I think partly precipitated by the COVID-19 pandemic. This extension was suggested by CMMI and the board and the other signatories approved that in late 2022. And the intent was for the extension to act as a bridge for uh, a future federal state model that would allow Medicare to continue to participate in advanced payment reform. And at the time that was expected um, to occur in 2025. So the, <clears throat> so the extension is um, currently set to end at um, the end of 2024. And I just wanna thank um, members of the board and the um, staff at the Green Mountain Care Board because um, this is a heavy lift in terms of implementation and um, the close collaboration that we've enjoyed has really um, been an asset. Next slide. <clears throat> 
So this, um, this just provides a little more detail about um, the current model. And I want to emphasize, you know, the header here actually says it all. Um, but what we really, you know, what this agreement allows us to do is it allows us to have and sustain Medicare participation in multi-payer alternative payment models in Vermont. And that type of participation and alignment um, is really important for the goals that we're trying to achieve. So again, the original agreement, um, uh, well, five performance years, six-year agreement, 2017, um, was considered a ramp-up year. Um, it's, a, it's an arrangement sort of in its most basic sense, the all-payer ACO model agreement is an arrangement between Vermont and CMS, the federal government, that allows Medicare, Medicaid, and commercial insurers to pay for health care in a different way. We're, what we're trying to do is shift from paying for each service on a fee for service basis and shift toward paying for high performance and good outcomes. So a value based model. The changing how we pay for services, the intent there is really um, to achieve what is called the triple aim, which is reducing um, the growth in healthcare costs to maintain and improve quality of care and improve the overall health of Vermonters. And I think as most people know, the current model relies on an accountable care organization, that's One Care Vermont, um, to develop a voluntary network of healthcare providers, and those providers agree to be accountable for the care and cost for the patients that are attributed to them. Next slide. So, um, as I mentioned, 2023 to 2024 represents an extension of the original agreement. We executed that extension. It was signed in late 2022. The agreement terms are um, very similar to the original model. Um, the extension is in place for this year, and the state has accepted the option to extend the agreement through 2024. One of the really important things that um, continuing this agreement does is it allows us to continue to take advantage of Medicare investments in Vermont. And a good example is the innovations that have been um, developed under the Blueprint for Health um, to support primary care practices. So Medicare contributes to per member per month payments for participating primary care practices that have become recognized as patient-centered medical homes. And Medicare continues to provide support for community health teams in each region of the state that provide additional services for people with complex needs. Without this agreement, that um, we would not um, have that Medicare investment in the Blueprint for Health. And similarly, um, One Care has developed a program called Comprehensive Payment Reform that supports um, independent primary care practices. And again, our participation in this model and Medicare's participation in this model has allowed um, support for that program to continue as well. Next slide. So as we think about a future Medicare multi-payer agreement, and I'll have more to say about that um, in a few slides, um, starting in 2025, um, what we know is that the federal government is developing a multi-state, multi-payer model um, for the future. The, the model that we currently have is Vermont specific. We're the only state that has this model 
And um, the federal government is really looking for the future to have a multi-state model and not a specific uh, Vermont model. And so to the extent possible, um, we are um, trying to provide feedback on model design. Um, it's challenging because, um, you know, CMS hasn't, um, hasn't issued um, much information about the model. And so we're doing the best we can to try and um, articulate Vermont's priorities. Um, when that model does get released, we will then want to take a very careful look at it um, with, with stakeholder engagement to see if it um, meets the state's needs. Next slide. Um, this is a rough timeline of, um, you know, how we look to engage with the Center for uh, Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, which is the part of CMS that is developing this model. Um, in is, is sort of late last year, uh, we really, um, you know, tried to convene um, some some groups to see if we could um, provide some initial preliminary feedback to CMMI um, on um, its priorities that it was sharing and um, our priorities as well. Um, a lot of that work during that time also really focused on how to support short-term stability for our healthcare system as we were coming out of the, um, out of the pandemic. And then um, this year, from January, um, you know, through the rest of the year, we're continuing to meet with CMMI as we can to provide um, what feedback we can. Um, we're seeking to gather um, feedback. We've uh, developed some technical work groups, which we'll say more about um, in a minute. Um, we're looking to obtain broad stakeholder engagement. We've begun um, that work as well, um, but really for the rest of the year, trying to get um, the feedback that we can to then try and use to communicate with CMMI and to um, develop a response to a model offering should Vermont decide to proceed with such a response. And then um, again, you know, sort of looking at the later half of this year, it looks like we will be um, provided with a formal opportunity to participate in a multi-state, multi-payer model from CMMI. At some point in 2023, it's looking like that's going to be later in the year, um, possibly sometime in the fall. Once that is released, we will then um, need to decide whether we want to participate. And if so, that's when we'll be developing a proposal in response to the model offering. Next slide. So just wanted to um, spend a minute talking about what, you know, why, you know, why do we want to do this? What are the benefits of continuing to include Medicare in um, Vermont's reform efforts? And there, there are several. Um, one is that um, we want, we would like to um, get continued recognition of Vermont as being a, you know, pretty long time low cost state for Medicare. Um, if we were to let participation in a in a multi-payer model that includes Medicare to lapse, um, it's possible that a new baseline um, with savings targets and spending trend could be calculated. And if it doesn't um, sort of give us credit or look at our history, of being a low cost state, um, that could end up being um, detrimental to um, Vermonters, to providers, and to our ability um, to meet targets and retain savings. Um, similarly, we, um, you know, our 
we want to make sure that when we look at um, financial targets and baseline financial calculations, that we um, recognize that there are some Vermont reforms that have been demonstrated to save money for Medicare. And we um, tend to call this accrued savings. But a really good example of that is the Blueprint for Health and the um, Support and Services at Home Program, SASH, where um, we've been participating now for over a decade. Medicare has been supporting um, that participation. They've been paying their share, as I mentioned earlier. And having, you know, we want to make sure that when we're looking at what has Vermont um, provided to Medicare, that those savings over time are recognized and that they're um, part of the financial calculations. Obviously, um, including Medicare and Vermont's health care reform efforts does give us the ability um, to potentially influence what reimbursement is looked like, looks like, what the payment model looks like, and so forth. Again, um, we continue, as long as there's Medicare participation, to get um, that support for um, the blueprint. That's about $10 million annually. Next slide. A couple of other benefits um, in our existing model, we have some waivers of Medicare regulations um, that have been beneficial to Vermont. And one example is that there is a regulation that there be a three-day stay, inpatient stay, before a person with Medicare um, can be discharged to a skilled nursing facility. Um, we have a waiver for that um, regulation in our current model. And it also gives us the ability to propose new waivers if there are Medicare rules that we think um, make it make sense to have a waiver of those. And then fundamentally, what uh, Medicare's participation really does is it allow it gives them the flexibility to pay in a way um, that that works with Vermont. So what we see is alignment and priorities, alignment and payment models, alignment and quality measures and reporting. And all of that is supportive of our healthcare system partners who um, are trying to juggle a lot. And it sends a stronger signal in terms of what not only our priorities are as a state, but it brings the federal government on board as well with those priorities. Um, one um, sort of you know, detail that I want to make sure we mention is that our current model is what's considered an advanced alternative uh, payment model by the federal government. And as such, it means that our um, primary care and specialty care providers um, don't have to um, meet um, federal, it's called a merit-based incentive payment system requirements. They they get the um, they they get the benefits of that simply because um, our model is considered an advanced alternative payment model. So um, any sort of a break in that would mean that our providers would have to revert to the what's called the MIPS system. Next slide. So just this is just a graphic description of um, Vermont as a low cost state uh, for Medicare. This is a um, per capita or per beneficiary um, spending growth. Vermont is the dashed line. Uh, the U.S. as a whole is the solid line. Uh, and our spending um, has been below um, the national average, um, as you can see, for quite some time, hearkening back to the, um, you know, to the early 90s. And, um, you know, growth, sometimes our growth maybe has been a little higher than the national average. Sometimes it's been lower. Um, across the years, it's um, it's run fairly comparable um, to national averages. 
Um, but you can see in 2017, that's the year that we entered into the all-payer model agreement with CMMI, 2018 was the first performance year. You can see, um, you know, for the years that we have data, the cost growth has dropped pretty sharply um, compared to national spending. Uh, so it looks like, um, you know, there has been a bending of the cost curve in Vermont for um, Medicare spending. It compounds annually, so that leads to an e even greater divergence. Um, so just wanted to provide some uh, specific information on Vermont as a low-cost state. Next slide. This is, um, this is a pretty important slide. What's the focus and timing of um, the future multi-state, multi-payer model with CMMI. And we have gotten some very recent clarification from CMMI on particularly the timing of the future model. Um, again, as I said, CMMI is moving in the direction of offering only multi-state models. They are not planning to offer state-specific models. Uh, they've outlined seven priorities um, that'll be central to the model, and I'll share that in a moment. They are planning to provide more detail, as I previously mentioned, in the fall, and that's when we'll really have a sense of um, where things are going with this model. If they are able to release um, the what's called a notice of funding opportunity, it'll you'll hear the term NOFO for short. Um, if they are able to release that in the fall, um, it's likely that they'll be looking to states to outline their proposals in early 2024. CM, CMMI has recently informed um, Vermont that full implementation of a new multi-payer, multi-state payment model will occur in 2026. We had um, previously anticipated that it would be 2025, although I will say that we knew it was a, a very tight time frame, but we have just learned that it will now be 2026. So what, um, what that means is that um, we are now negotiating with CMMI what 2025 will look like here in Vermont. And our goal, um, I think it's a mutual goal um, with us and CMMI, is to ensure that we can provide a smooth transition to a new um, multi-payer model with Medicare in 2026. So that is um, very recent news that I wanted to um, share. At the same time that we're um, now talking about what will 2025 look like, we are continuing to discuss um, the future model. And so we're continuing to discuss that potential 2026 model as well. Next slide. This is a tentative timeline. I'm going to emphasize the word tentative because, again, it's very dependent on um, when that um, model, when those model details are released. Um, but fall 2023, we expect to see more details. Um, we'll um, want to engage in a broader stakeholder engagement process, although I'll, I'll say that that's really already um, begun. Um, early 2024 is when we expect those applications to be um, due. We would be working very closely with uh, GMCB staff to prepare that application for consideration. This will be a time when there will be um, you know, more public presentations to this group. Um, public comment periods. Um, oh, we already have opportunity for public comment, but there'll be um, a good deal more to comment on. Um, and then um, a vote of this of the Green Mountain Care Board would be required um, before submission. Later in 2024, if if we decide to um, submit a proposal, <clears throat> if we are selected, 
um, that it would be later in 2024 that um, detailed negotiations would occur with CMMI. And some examples of some of the areas that we might negotiate would be savings targets, um, what the Medicare payment model looks like, and so forth. 2025, as I mentioned on the previous slide, we're looking for a bridge um, from the current all-payer model agreement to CMMI's multi-state model. And what that will look like is dependent on our discussions. And then um, according to the new timeframe, 2026 would be that multi-state model launch. Next slide. So what do we know at this point about the new payment model that CMMI is, um, is developing? They, they have signaled that they're, you know, that they're looking to produce a design that addresses seven priorities and they're listed here. Um, the first four, I think we can call payment design um, priorities. Um, the last three we can call core principles. Um, so the first is that the CMMI model is expected to include as, um, as a payment mechanism global budgets for hospitals. So that's why we've been spending um, a lot of time thinking about global budgets. It will include um, a total cost of care target and approach. So looking at services that are included in the total cost of care and then setting a target there for um, what the expectations are in terms of cost growth. It will, you know, the goal is for it to be all payer. So to include um, Medicare, Medicaid, um, commercial insurance, and the desire is that there be a goal for minimum investment in primary care, meaning that there needs to be a minimum level of um, support for primary care. Those core principles, um, they want to include safety net providers from the start, and that would include federally qualified health centers. There is a um, a strong principle around uh, the model addressing mental health, substance use disorder, and social determinants of health. And there is um, the model will be, you know, have as a core principle health equity. CMMI issued a blog post um, a little while ago, and um, they actually asked that we um, provide this excerpt um, from that blog post in this um, presentation. And you'll see that um, a key area here is that, um, and it's really that last sentence, the future state-based total cost of care models under consideration will amplify Medicaid-led advanced primary care efforts by aligning Medicare fee-for-service and other payers to these efforts. So um, a, a big focus on advanced primary care. Next slide. Uh, this is, um, I hope folks can see this. This is a rather busy slide, but it's a really important one and I wanna spend a little bit of time on it. Um, this is um, our best effort at depicting um, our, our vision for a statewide approach to healthcare reform. And, you know, a lot of the work that's um, depicted in this slide is ongoing. But, you know, what we have, I think what we've learned over the years is that no one payment mechanism is going to do everything that we're looking to do in healthcare reform. And certainly not, <clears throat> not will not necessarily speak to the broader healthcare system. And so the way that we're looking at this is that, um, yes, it is important in that top box to have um, statewide total cost of care and quality targets. 
um, having those types of targets really helps um, set a course. It helps make sure that we're all rowing in the same direction. Um, it helps focus efforts. It helps support alignment. Um, but it is removed from individual providers and um, payment mechanisms that are more direct in terms of helping to support care transformation. So while it's an important part of any model, um, it is not the only part. So, you know, we're calling that sort of the broad structure that um, it supports efficiency, it supports quality um, across the system, and it's important as a compass, really. In that middle box, um, we believe there's an opportunity to support providers um, working together. And that's actually some feedback that we've um, gotten um, from um, some of our um, engagement efforts is that how can we, um, and we're calling these shared quality payments, but how can we reward and support um, providers who are working together? And there's some measures, a few measures um, that really speak to that. I've given an example of one, which is follow up after hospitalization for mental illness. That's a measure that speaks to both the hospital and to the um, and to the community providers working together to make sure that that follow up care occurs when someone is discharged from a hospital. There are other examples of measures, but that's one. And then when you get to that um, lower set of boxes um, for the different provider types, that's where you get to those more direct um, payment mechanisms and provider supports um, that hopefully can encourage um, the best possible care. And these can be multi-payer. They can be payer specific. Ideally, we'd like to see as much multi-payer um, work as possible. So um, there are some efforts that are uh, already underway in Vermont because of our historical approach to um, healthcare reform, and I'll um, provide a couple of those. For primary care, um, the example that we're giving is enhanced payments and population-based payments. An example of an enhanced payment is the Blueprint for Health um, per member per month payments that primary care receives. Uh, an example of a population-based payment is the work that um, One Care has done with independent primary care practices through their comprehensive payment reform program. So those are a couple of examples. Hospitals, Again, the what the signals we're getting from CMMI is that um, hospital global budgets or health system global budgets will be um, part of the model. So that's an example of a payment more directly um, to hospital providers. Specialists, we have you know some um, work in place, but you know that's definitely an area where we would want to continue to focus and focus more effort. Mental health and substance use disorder treatment providers, there um, we have uh, several um, payments in place now for adult and children's mental health through um, Medicaid and the Department of Mental Health. There's a case rate uh, program in place. We have enhanced payments through the hub and spoke model um, through the Blueprint for Health and uh, the Vermont Department of Health. And then we do have an episodic payment model for residential substance use disorder providers. So those are some examples of really direct to provider um, mechanisms with the intent of trans transforming uh, care delivery. Long-term care providers, we have um, some efforts underway, but um, you know some work to be done there as well and um, other provider types, including home health. So that's the vision, the overarching um, targets, important for alignment and rowing in the same direction, those shared quality payments 
for um, work that providers do together across the continuum of care, and then those more direct um, provider payments and supports um, that are dependent on the provider type. So I hope, again, it's a busy slide, um, but it really does depict um, the vision that we're trying to hew to as we do our work. Next slide. Um, this this talks about how we look to obtain input from Vermonters. Again, summer 2022, we are really focused on short-term stability for the system. That was important given where we are at. Um, in that in the fall, we began to gather um, input um, on the multi-state, multi-payer model. Um, really started some very technical discussions uh, on a potential global budget model um, for hospitals and potentially other services and the Medicare waivers that we might want to look at. And then later in um, 2023, um, we're looking to, you know, continue to broaden that stakeholder engagement that will include um, you know, public input. Um, there's uh, places on our website now, on both of our websites now for that, updates at these meetings, discussions at existing forums and other opportunities. Next slide. This is our current work group structure. Um, it's, you know, these are advisory groups. We have um, a healthcare reform work group. Then we've got a global budget technical advisory group, a Medicare waiver technical advisory group, and a payer advisory group. We're contemplating a care transformation advisory group as well. Next slide. And these are the organizations um, that are participating in our um, health care reform work group. Uh, you know, lots of provider organizations from across the continuum of care. Next slide. This shows our mechanisms for public input. Next slide. And this summarizes our feedback um, to CMMI. And, you know, these are themes that I think most people here have heard um, before, but we'll, you know, we're, we're repeating them as much as we can. One is that we want to see um, support for rural provider stability and sustainability with workforce and inflation being important concerns. Um, it's important to increase predictability of payments. We are able to see during the pandemic how helpful um, predictable payments were. We want to make sure that um, the model assures the right amount of revenue with recognition that we're a low-cost state for Medicare. Support for investments in preventive and community care is really important. Um, making sure that to the extent possible, those payment models and quality measures are aligned across payers. Um, and then um, really allowing Vermont to keep moving forward on the healthcare reform efforts that we've um, achieved to date. That includes care for people with complex health and social needs, support for primary care, again, blueprint and comprehensive payment reform being two examples, and support for community-based services, um, critical um, elements of a model going forward. Next slide. And next steps, we'll continue to meet um, with CMMI as we can. We'll continue to gather input um, however we can, and we will um, carefully review that model when it's released by CMMI to ensure that it's good for Vermont. And we'll continue to um, and really step up um, gathering of input in formulating our response. I think that's the end of my slides. Thank you very much, Ms. Jones. Um, turn it to board members for any comments or questions they may have. 
I don't have any at this time, Pat, but that was really thorough and really helpful. I really appreciate it. And I'm looking forward to the updates that we're going to, you know, as as this process unfolds, learning more. So I really appreciate the the catching up on where we are and where we're going. Thank you. And I also don't really have anything. The only uh, other point maybe that I wanted to throw in the mix around the MIPS implementation is MIPS came, came into effect while we were in the all pair model, as you said. So while we talk about reverting to it, we have never actually had to implement it as a state. So I think I know we're working to try and get a better understanding of what that might mean um, for providers so that we understand if you know, maybe that's a good thing. I don't know. I think I've heard it's complicated and there's some administrative burden. So I look forward to understanding that better in the future. Thanks, Pat. Thank you. I don't have anything either. Um, well, I was distracted by your background, making sure there's no gondola at the top of that. Um, and it looks like we're okay. Um, I'll turn it to any public comment. Uh, Mr. Del Treco, please go ahead. Thank you, Chair Foster. Uh, Pat, you always do such a great job, so I really appreciate it. Um, I forget what slide it was, maybe 13. I think that you called it the busy slide or the one with a lot of information on it. You know, one of the challenges we've had um, in the all payer model is, is getting all payers into the fold. Um, we have largely, we have two commercial carriers in Vermont. I know that there's others that come in in a transient way uh, through ERISA plans, but um, I mean, maybe this is too big of a question for right now. Do you think the uh, things are going to get easier or harder under this delay and time period? And, 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 I'm, and I'm specifically thinking about the new relationship with Blue Cross Blue Shield and the blues of Michigan, like it, what does that look like? And, you know, part of my hmm, mindset was maybe maybe a deal couldn't have happened at that time frame uh, when when there was negotiations happening because um, because there was a deal trying to be made between two organizations. So it's kind of like when the, you go for a mortgage and they say, don't buy anything until sign, sign off. So maybe it was something along those lines, but how do we see, um, you know, that going forward and uh, interestingly enough on the MIPS piece, is there any way to get a sort of a, a, a you know, the, a speed pass around MIPS as we wait for this postponement? Um, be, you know, this isn't, you know, we've always participated in reform. We've been huge advocates um, and, to, you know, to be penalized because of a delay seems a little bit um like a backhanded compliment. So I'll, I'll stop there. Thanks. I think some of those might be a little beyond today's um, presentation. They're good questions, but we might try and get back to you on those, Mr. Del Treco, I think. Um, sure. Uh, although I saw Ms. Teachout's hand go up. So um, I'll, Walter, I'll pass you, you're next, but I'll go to Ms. Teachout first, if that's okay. Thank you um, very much. Um, I just wanted to be very clear and say that our decisions about participation in healthcare reform here in the state of Vermont have nothing to do with the proposed affiliation. All of those decisions are made independently by our executive team. Great, thank you for the public comment. Um, and Mr. Carpenter, Walter, please go ahead. Hi, Owen, can you hear me? I can, but I can't see you. Usually I get to see you. Yeah, the video camera doesn't work, is, isn't working right now. I don't know what's going on with it. I just wanted to ask Pat exactly what a multi-payer Medicare is. So what um, does that constitute? Yeah, perhaps I, um, I uh, wasn't clear. So let me take a run at it. <laughs> um, Medicare is a, you know, is a payer, Medicaid commercial. Medicare is, you know, developing this model, but their, um, one of their principles is that it be a multi-payer model so that they not be the only payer 
participating in this model. They'd like to see Medicaid participate as well, and they'd like to see uh, commercial insurers participate as well. So Medicare itself isn't multi-payer, but they are trying to design a model that will, will entail participation by multiple payers. Does that help clarify, Walter? Uh, it more it confuses more. <laughs> I guess that's clarification in the healthcare world. Okay. Uh, thank you, Walter, for the question. Any other public comment? Okay, great. Um, Ms. Jones, thank you very much. Nice to see you, and we appreciate the update. Thank you. All right, have a good day. Um, so before we turn to Ms. Kinsler, um, why don't we take a nine minute break and we'll just come back at uh, uh, 2.50. Thank you. Okay, looks like everyone's back. Um, so we can resume and I'll turn to uh, Ms. Kinsler. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Uh, one moment while I get screen, screen sharing going. Right. Can folks uh, see what they need to see? Excellent. Um, Chair Foster, you should know that we can't actually see you at the moment, um, or at least it uh, looks that way to me. Oh, there you are. OK. Um, all right. Well, thank you um, so much for having me at the board meeting today. Um, I'm going to provide an update uh, on the board's work around hospital sustainability, which is uh, update maybe is a little bit of um, a misnomer. Uh, really, it'll be kind of a historical look back. Um, as well as a bit of an update, um, and then an update on our work to develop a global payment model um, as, as required in Act 167. Um, for the record, I should state, uh, this is Sarah Kinsler, Director of Health Systems Policy at the board, um, and I'll, uh, I'll actually be joined by uh, an, 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 old, an old friend from uh, our last agenda item, Pat Jones, Interim Director of Healthcare Reform for the Agency of Human Services. Um, who co-chairs our uh, Global Budget Technical Advisory Group, and we'll be speaking uh, to a little bit of that content. So thank you, Pat, for uh, sticking around for uh, the remainder of the board meeting today, or much of the remainder. Um, so I'm going to uh, give us a little bit of legislative history uh, to contextualize this work um, and remind folks kind of how, how we landed uh, in the position of um, pursuing global payments in particular. Um, so, big picture, um, it's the board's work to regulate hospitals that has brought this to the forefront for us. And I think um, all of the presentations that you've heard today, um, Sarah and Tom uh, to start, Pat just now, um, and then this presentation tied together really nicely uh, in, in thinking about how this work can evolve and support the state's goals. Um, a little bit of background on this work. Um, it's been building for quite a few years now, uh, both in the work of the GMCB uh, and in the legislature. Um, so I'll I'll be um, as brief as humanly possible when when I walk through this timeline. But in in 2019, um, the legislature uh, required the board to convene the Rural Health Services Task Force um, with the purpose of evaluating the current state of rural health care in Vermont and identifying ways to sustain the system and ensure it provides access to affordable, high quality health care services. So I think. Um, those goals still resonate and will sound very familiar um, to many of us uh, in the work that has that has come since 2019. There were 14 members designated in statute, and they met throughout the second half of 2019. Um, really brought brought together a lot of people to think hard about the the future of Vermont's rural healthcare system and how to ensure um, that all Vermonters can access high quality, affordable care. Um, that same year. JMCB required a subset of hospitals to develop sustainability plans um, due to persistently low uh, and declining margins and the news that Springfield Hospital would enter uh, bankruptcy. Um, in 2020, obviously, um, the pandemic hit uh, requirements uh, for hospitals to develop sustainability, pl sustainability plans were expanded and then uh, in part building on the Rural Health Services Task Force work. Uh, the legislature passed Act 159, which required uh, work on two major reports. Um, I think uh, most saliently here, um, the hospital sustainability report, but also a, a report on options for regulating provider reimbursement, which is going to come up a couple of times here. Um, and those uh, reports are linked here on the page. Um, 
a lot of work in 2021 um, went into developing that hospital sustainability report, including a lot of analysis and stakeholder engagement, um, noting that uh, a lot of our provider partners were really focused on COVID response at that time. Um, and then finally, in 2022, uh, the hospital sustainability report was released um, with hospital global payments as one major recommendation, um, and in part growing out of the legislative uh, discussion around the findings and recommendations in that report, the legislature packed, passed Act 167, which really we've discussed, uh, you know, kind of uh, three quarters of the first two sections of that um, in our in our three presentations this afternoon. Um, these recommendations were also uh, echoed by two legislative consultants um, who recommended uh, pursuing global payments as well. Um, so the board ended up with um, 4.1 million in de dedicated funding for these activities across um, work on the all payer model, global hospital global payment model, regulatory um, evolution work. Uh, it, you know, in in the vein of what Sarah was discussing earlier, um, and then some work to uh, engage communities and providers to inform hospital transformation. Um, there are a lot of kind of long running themes that go across this work. Um, and, and since it's been quite some time since we've discussed um, the hospital sustainability report in particular, I thought it would be helpful to provide a, a brief overview of kind of that the path of the logic that goes through that report um, of why this work is so important uh, and some of the findings that came out of the analysis there and, and the recommendations as well. Um, so I do want to note that uh, I haven't updated the slides in it in every case. So in some cases, this uh, this comes from a report that's a few years old now, but um, they're they're largely illustrative to kind of walk you through the path that got us here today. Um, so to take a step back, um, we talked about what spurred the initial requirements for hospitals to do sustainability plans in 2019. Um, but I wanted to take a moment to look at the role of hospitals in our healthcare system. I don't think anyone. Uh, on this call today um, would question the fact that hospitals are a vital part of Vermont's healthcare system. Um, but when we look at the numbers, um, how much of the system is hospitals? Um, so when we look at healthcare expenditures associated with Vermont healthcare providers, um, hospitals are just under half the system. That is a, a huge um, that is a huge piece of our healthcare system. Um, again, this uh, this isn't news to anyone, but I wanted to drive home that if we're um, when we regulate healthcare, it's really critical for us to be thinking about hospitals and their role in the system. And when we think about reform, um, current and future reform, um, we really can't do that without thinking about the role of hospitals. Um, so, you know, we've talked a, a lot over the past few years about hospital cost coverage um, and, you know, what is um, what are the factors that are um, feeding into hospitals margins? Um, and so when, when we look at cost coverage, um, I've included a, um, a small chart here that really is um, that really is illustrative. This is not real hospital data. Um, it's kind of sample data to show us, um, you know, the basic concept, which is that hospital um, cost coverage, hospital paid amounts vary across um, payers, they vary by service and they vary by hospital. So, um, you know, in, in general, um, paid amounts and cost coverage are higher uh, in commercial payers um, than Medicare and usually Medicaid, um, the lowest for most services. Um, and why does cost coverage vary? So um, one reason for this, is revenue, um, you know, higher bargaining power and the ability to negotiate prices. Uh, a second reason is potentially preferential reimbursement rates to ensure access in, in certain communities like the critical access hospital Medicare reimbursement methodology. Um, on the cost side, um, we know that uh, a hospital smaller size could limit economies of scale. Um, in general, um, efficiency, what's, what Sarah and Tom were discussing uh, earlier today, um, you know, potentially plays a big part, as well as human capital and labor expenses. Those are just, you know, examples of things on the cost side that could uh, impact cost coverage. And then finally, some hospitals prioritize investing in low margin services that are necessary for communities, things like mental health and primary care, which tend to be low margin. Um, others may prioritize higher margin services, either to uh, fund low margin services and kind of um, uh, cross subsidized within their business uh, or to, um, you know, make a higher margin. Um, so what does all this mean? Um, this data is updated from the past few years. We're looking at hospital charge growth, um, noting that char charges are payer agnostic from 2016 to 2023. 
um, as you know, folks can see a pretty um, significant uh, upward trend uh, since 2017. So how does this uh, how does this play out? Um, when we look at our QHP premium increases, we see that uh, within uh, the cost of healthcare, medical services um, are you know, the biggest chunk of the overall trend. Primary driver there is unit costs, also known as price, um, not utilization trends. Nonetheless, we see declining operating margins um, for our hospitals, and this is really a system wide issue. So. Um, you know, both the the as we look across all Vermont hospitals, we see um, some pretty low numbers there in margin. But we also see it when we look at critical access hospitals broken out, at PPS hospitals broken out. Um, this really is impacting our entire healthcare system. Um, and finally, what does this mean for Vermonters? So we know that hospital financial distress uh, has has you know potential for big negative impacts on Vermonters. Um, their impacts on affordability. Um, for Vermonters, um, you know, uh, when hospitals um, increase charges uh, to try to cover costs or make a margin, um, you know, this shows up particularly in commercial insurance rates. There are potential impacts on quality. Hospitals in financial distress um, struggle to maintain quality and patient safety. Uh, and finally, um, there's potentially big impacts on access. So financial distress is a key predictor uh, in determining likelihood of hospital closure. Um, and that would really uh, impact uh, communities' access to care, um, particularly uh, we think the, the most vulnerable communities, those who are um, least able to, um, to kind of travel for, to a further hospital. So this slide shows um, the recommendations that uh, GMCB brought to the legislature in 2022 um, coming out of that report. Um, so uh, the and these are just two among many recommendations. Uh, again, the findings of this report were really robust. A ton of analysis went into um, this report. Um, as a side note, um, we have had um, discussion of some of the analyses that have that fed into the sustainability report quite frequently over the past few years. Um, we recently. Uh, in fact, just this morning, uh, updated the Green Mountain Care Board's website to make those more accessible in one place. So um, if folks visit the Green Mountain Care Board's website and go to the Hospital Sustainability and Act 167 page, um, they all of the kind of analyses that fit into this, the board presentations um, that the board received from contractors and experts are all um, now more easily accessible there. So um, these are just two of the recommendations, or really one recommendation with two parts that came out of this report. Um, but I wanted to highlight it because it, it kind of tie, ties the room together of uh, everything we've talked about today. Um, so the first recommendation is hospital payment reform. Uh, and really, uh, the hospital payment reform that we, we focused on um, in this report and in discussions with the legislature um, were hospital global budgets or hospital global payments. Um, and secondly, uh, noting that this work really has to go hand in hand um, with work to engage communities in envisioning a sustainable future for their healthcare systems, uh, in thinking about the needs and resources that they have locally, and in thinking about um, you know how how we can make create a system um, that uh, that provides accessible, high quality care uh, to Vermonters at an affordable price. Um, Simultaneously, uh, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, uh, legislative consultants were making very similar recommendations. So things kind of coalesced um, ar around the idea of um, a new a new hospital payment model, or, or at least developing and modeling a new hospital payment model. Um, and all of this comes together in Act 167. Um, so the Act 167 has many sections. Uh, this is kind of the first chunk of Act 167. Um, this is where we're focused today. And really, I think we'll hit uh, just about uh, this whole uh, little rainbow line of boxes here today. Um, you know, Pat, it it all uh, there. There could be uh, arrows flowing back and forth. Um, you know, throughout all of these, really. Um, I do want to note that. Um, Green Mountain Care Board's current hospital budget review process, which Sarah Lindbergh and Tom Reese spoke about, uh, spoke with you about earlier, um, already in some ways function like a hospital global budget in some ways, uh, providing an overall cap on revenue. revenue. Um, there's, there's so much interaction here, and so we'll talk about that concept a little bit more um, as we go forward. Um, now I'm going to um, hand the mic over to Pat Jones for a couple of minutes. Um, Pat is one of the co-chairs of our Hospital Global Budget Technical Advisory Group, um, along with 
Green Mountain Care Board member Robin Lunge. Um, and so Pat will talk about um, some of the conceptual issues related to um, hospital global payments, what they are, um, uh, why why we've kind of gone down this path, um, and I'll, uh, then I'll talk about the work of the TAG a little bit more. Thank you, Sarah. Um, thank you for letting me come back um, today. Again, for the record, my name is Pat Jones. I'm Interim Director of Healthcare Reform for the Agency of Human Services. Next slide. <clears throat> so um, I want to start by just um, being clear about what we mean by hospital global payments. And so we've adapted uh, a definition from the Urban Institute. Global payments are fixed, often prepaid amounts of funding for a certain period of time for a specified population rather than fixed rates for individual services or cases. So clearly a distinction between hospital global payments and fee-for-service payments. Um, one of the reasons, you know, why folks are really interested in looking at the hospital global payments as a um, potential payment model is that they can really support hospitals and payers and they can help the state advance our goals in healthcare reform to control costs and to improve quality. The way that they can do that is through, first of all, ensuring steady, predictable financing. Um, you know, we saw, again, how predictability was really important um, during the beginning of the COVID-19 um, public health emergency when um, revenues would otherwise have um, been falling rapidly. They can provide flexibility. You know, when we do um, payment reform, a lot of what we hear is even, you know, even when, you know, more money can't necessarily be generated, predictability and flexibility are um, key um, assets in doing um, healthcare and payment reform. So in the case of hospital global payments, it, um, provides that flexibility for hospitals to um, change their service offerings based on what um, community needs are. Uh, it can, these payments can move financial incentives away from volume and really support more efficient care that reduces some, uh, you know, avoidable or low value care and result in positive health outcomes, and then um, controlling the growth in hospital spending at an affordable level is another potential benefit of hospital global payments. Next slide. So there are, you know, there are, there can be risks with hospital global payments, and we want to make sure that um, we're clear about that. That can include um, over incentivizing um, reductions in care provided. Um, you know, if there's a fixed amount of funding coming in. Um, and uh, care would be um, reduced in a way that's not appropriate. That's a, a potential risk. On the other hand, there's also a potential risk that there wouldn't be enough funds to cover the true cost of providing care. So both are risks. If we can mitigate those risks, the result can um, really be a win-win um, alignment where hospitals, um, payers, um, consumers, and um, the state see their needs met. Um, we need to really be careful and ensure that we're balancing the concerns and the priorities of all parties. Um, you know, one really, I think Sarah really alluded to this in her um, prior presentation, but um, ensuring that we have um, robust community engagement 
where community needs are um, identified. Um, we understand um, the population of a particular community. We understand how care is delivered. What are those care patterns? All of that um, is important when we're looking to design a global payment model that works uh, for us um, as a state and for all Vermonters. Next slide. This, um, this depicts um, in a graphic format um, what that value proposition can be for global payments. So um, the goal, improved affordability, better health, um, what, what patients can see is that they're able to receive care that's matched to their needs. Um, they, um, the result can be better health and more affordable care. For providers, um, that predictable revenue, the flexibility, and then support for care delivery transformation as well um, can be an outcome of global payments. And then for payers, um, predictable cost growth, is a is a potential outcome and then um, better value as well as care um, becomes more efficiently delivered. Next slide. So we, you know, there are some states, um, three in particular around the country that have um, um, attempted uh, implementation of hospital uh, global budgets or global payment programs. Um, one is um, the New York Hospital Experimental Payment Program that was in place from 1980 to 1987. Maryland has the longest tenure in working with um, hospital global budgets. Uh, they have an all-payer model and a total cost of care model that's really predicated on hospital global budgets. And that's been in place from 2010 to the present, and it's evolved over time. And then Pennsylvania more recently, starting in 2019, has implemented a rural health model that um, that has hospital global budgets or budget or global payments as well. Um, you know, clearly there's differences between states. Um, you know, the models are um, unique. They certainly reflect um, what's happening in the state in terms of policies and their market dynamics, but there's a lot that can be learned. And so Vermont really is looking to these examples to see if we can gain insight as we uh, move forward in considering hospital global payments. Next slide. So this is our, you know, this shows the membership of our um, hospital global budget technical advisory group, a number of organizations um, currently participating. And uh, as Sarah said, uh, board member Lunge and myself are uh, co-facilitating this group. Um, for folks who are on the phone who participate, um, in this group, I want to offer our thanks. It's um, very detailed and technical um, information and discussion, um, very important discussion just to understand um, the current landscape and um, what some of the pressures that the system is facing are, including, I would add, affordability, um, as well as, um, you know, financial challenges we have representation from the Office of Healthcare Advocate and from the Vermont NEA on yes. this group, and that's been, um, been very helpful. Next slide. So the purpose and meeting structure. Um, the charge to the group really has been to um, make recommendations for conceptual and technical specifications for a hospital global budget or global payment program. We want to try and um, you know gather that input so that we're ready when CMMI introduces the multi-state. Uh, model that I referenced during my prior presentation. 
we, you know, we think there's going to be some ability um, for the state maybe to tailor its methodology a little bit, but there's also likely to be some limitations and guardrails as to, you know, how um, how it looks compared to the model design features that are put out. The um, so again, the deliverable we want those. Um, you know, we want to have detailed specifications, if possible, um, that are informed by input from this group. The group is meeting, um, start meeting in January, is likely to meet um, into November. We have two hour meetings and they occur about every three weeks. So, um, you know, quite a lot of work. And again, wanna thank those who have um, participated. Next slide. I believe Sarah um, will take the mic back at this point. So thank you again for the opportunity to be here. Thanks so much, Pat. Uh, can you all hear me? Yes, excellent. Okay. Um, so I'll I'll walk us through a little bit of what the tag uh, has discussed so far and some of the preliminary recommendations that are coming out of that group. Um, and then I'll highlight some areas um, where we think the board will will perhaps have particular interest and and will um, be explicitly seeking your feedback, noting that, of course, we're seeking your feedback on all of this work. Um, and finally, we'll highlight some uh, opportunities for board and public input as well. Um, so between now and the end of 2023, we'll be working fairly methodically through this series of issues that are listed on the slide. Um, they're here at a pretty high level. Uh, I'm going to cover the first, oh, I don't know, uh, five bullets probably here, uh, and then we'll talk about, you know, the work that's still to be done. Um, so topics covered to date, um, I, I want to, uh, I guess, hedge a little bit. Um, there's not consensus on all of these points. Um, they're all subject to, um, you know, the state's consideration to make sure that there's policy alignment and operational feasibility, um, potentially alignment with a federal model. Um, but these are, um, you know, the topics where we've had input to date from the, from the TAG meeting participants. So um, I'll start with services uh, included uh, in the hospital global payments. Um, uh, the TAG uh, proposed that all hospital inpatient and outpatient services uh, be included with the possible exception of infrequent and high cost hospital services. Um, that is an issue that uh, the TAG is going to continue to come back to uh, informed by data to help us get a sense of what exactly that would mean and what that would look like. Um, Secondly, uh, to include both employed and non-employed professional services built under the hospital's tax ID, um, that's a TIN, um, but not non-employed professionals not built under the hospital's TIN. Um, third, uh, the TAG recommended that at least some hospital-owned facility-based services uh, be included um, with phased inclusion of additional services over time. Uh, and lastly, corporate parent-owned entities on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, so, and I think the theme here um, is having a budget that's fairly inclusive uh, and having a budget um, that will capture uh, enough of um, a hospital's business to get the benefits and the benefits of the incentives of the global payment model. Um, secondly, uh, we discussed the populations included uh, in a hospital global budget or hospital global payment model. Uh, the TAG recommended to include uh, Vermont Medicaid members, not out-of-state Medicaid program members, um, all Medicare fee-for-service beneficiaries who receive Vermont care, care at Vermont hospitals, um, and as many commercially insured individuals as possible, um, including both Vermont and non-Vermont residents who receive care at Vermont hospitals. Um, again, the theme here uh, is capturing a critical mass um, with, uh, you know, a similar um, a similar logic as kind of the scale targets in our current agreement, which is that if you want an incentive to work, you've got to get um, enough of the population in or enough of the, the dollars in um, to kind of see see that benefit and and change the way um, change the way the business operates. Um, I do want to know that there still will be people and dollars outside of this payment methodology. So um, we we don't really see a universe in which a hospital's entire revenue um, would potentially be captured. There are still going to be instances where it really makes sense for things to be um, outside that model, and that was something that the tag um, the tag recognized as well. 
Um, so third, um, and this is where we start to get a little bit more technical, I would say, um, calculating the baseline budget payments. Um, we're uh, you know, using net patient revenue from Medicaid, Medicare, and participating commercial uh, as the primary data source. Um, we're calculating at a facility level, not system level. So we're not thinking of creating a, a budget for all of Vermont and then breaking it up, nor are we thinking of creating a, a budget for a healthcare, a health system and then breaking it up among uh, member organizations. We're really thinking about each facility individually. Um, and then finally, the tag discussed potential one time adjustments to the baseline budget to account for hospital financial condition, uh, inflation trends, demographics, uh, and policy changes. When we talk about in inflation trends and demographic changes, we're really talking about how to get from um, a, a baseline, so the most recent year of data, to the first performance year. Um, and then finally, I think the kind of meatiest area of our discussion so far here, it's on one slide, but this has been like, um, you know, probably eight hours of meetings uh, is uh, annual and ad hoc adjustments. So once you've got your baseline budget, how do you trend forward? Um, so uh, here, some of the things that we've discussed um, are making annual adjustments to the uh, to the global budget for things like inflation trends. And there we're talking about how to balance hospital cost inflation um, with uh, affordability for consumers, uh, how to take into account demographic changes that have happened over the course of the year. Um, we're also going to have in, in our future meetings discussion about adjustments for things like efficiency or potentially avoidable utilization uh, and how to reward for high value care. Um, Secondly, uh, making annual and potentially uh, mid-year adjustments for changes in utilization. Um, there are two potential approaches uh, to this that we've discussed really at length, um, and we've kind of had mixed tag feedback, so I'd say stay tuned on that. Um, third, we want to ensure that there's two-sided accountability um, for total cost of care. Um, going back to the slide that Pat uh, presented, uh, in her earlier slides with the portfolio model, that's kind of, you know, those overarching incentives that link um, what's happening at, uh, in a particular provider organization um, or in a payment model designed for a particular provider type and thinking about how that links to, um, to the continuum of care uh, and really promotes, um, uh, you know, pursuing aligned goals for the full population we think is very important still. Um, and then finally, um, the TAG uh, is discussing uh, considering adjustments for mitigating provider risk, uh, provider financial risk in extreme circumstances. So that might mean things like monitoring for changes in utilization um, or, or monitoring for negative margins beyond a certain threshold that could trigger um, a more uh, in-depth look and potentially an ad hoc adjustment um, to ensure that this model isn't so risky that are, um, you know, that it that it would endanger hospitals. So as we look ahead, um, we're currently working to develop um, a straw model uh, based on the TAG recommendations to date. Um, that straw model development process has required state staff and contractors to really face the face up to some serious data and operational challenges. Uh, in kind of meeting the tags recommendations, for example, we're really struggling um, with uh, inclusion of professional services because uh, of, of kind of the limited number of professional claims that are linked to a hospital, which we don't think quite lines up with the number of professional services that are actually delivered at hospitals. So we're dealing with some data challenges and operational challenges that may prevent us from achieving all of the rec of the tags recommendations are kind of all of the state's goals in the initial years um, of any program that we implement. Um, so we're thinking about how to uh, we're thinking about how to to set a solid foundation if this is something that the state pursues, um, and then think about how to grow or add on to that solid foundation over time. Um, and in the meantime, we're continuing to tackle key issues, so uh, strategies to support care transformation the terms of payer and hospital participation, um, how we deal with budget calculation and payment operations. Uh, and I would add to that uh, kind of the intersections with existing regulatory structures in the state, uh, as well as monitoring and evaluation, which we think is a particularly critical uh, area to be focused on um, in light of kind of the, the, the pros and drawbacks um, of, a, of a global payment model. Um, as Pat mentioned, uh, materials are posted uh, online, and I've linked uh, here to where those live on the board's website. So 
what are the key areas where um, where we where we think the board might particularly want to give input, noting that we would love your input on any of these areas. Um, firstly, um, the baseline budget and setting the baseline. So uh, how should we trend um, baseline uh, claims to the current day? Um, what adjustments, if any, should be made to the base budget? Um, secondly, annual trends and adjustment. So are, are we looking at the right adjustments? Uh, how should we balance keeping up with inflation and hospital costs with affordability? How can we incentivize efficiency, reduce waste, and reward the, the kinds of behavior and the kinds of care that we want to see? Um, third, uh, regulatory mechanism. Obviously, this one's close to our heart at GMCB. Um, how could Vermont administer global payments? Um, you know, what are the, the regulatory authorities and mechanisms that we could consider using? Um, I've listed, um, you know, here the board has provider rate setting authority that we haven't exercised in the past. Um, we've also got payer regulatory levers. Other, other levers exist across state government, and we'd want to kind of think about that. Um, you know, it related, as I'd mentioned earlier, our current, current hospital uh, budget review process already works like a global budget in some ways, setting a cap on total revenue um, and, and controlling for charge growth. Um, so when we talk about developing global payments, we're really talking about, you know, how could we add a floor to complement that cap? Um, so we're kind of trying to envision how, um, how this would nest underneath our hospital regulatory approach that we already have. Uh, and that's Sarah and her team are working to, to um, you know, explore um, how to grow. And then finally, um, as we look at quality and monitoring and evaluation, what quality measures should be part of a global payment model? And second, and, and probably more expansively, what measures need to be part of our monitoring framework so that we can um, so that we can be really attentive uh, to any unintended consequences so that we can make sure that we're, we're, we're watching out and making sure that um, that the benefits um, of this model are coming through and that we're not seeing uh, potential drawbacks. Um, so this slide um, kind of goes beyond just our uh, global payment uh, model development work, which is kind of the things under the orange box, and also includes um, the subsequent all pair model agreement. And, and I wanted to include both of these here, both thinking about uh, when board members will have a chance to have input and when the public uh, and stakeholders will have a chance to have input. Um, Pat covered some of this already, so I, I apologize where this is repetitive. Um, on the all pair model, uh, board members will have an opportunity to weigh in on that state application. Um, our staff will, you know, support development of any application, uh, and and the board would also, um, uh, you know, vote vote prior to submission and vote prior to a signature of um, of any final agreement. On the on the public side, um, you know, we're receiving input on kind of a potential high level Medicare methodology from the global budget tag. Um, AHS also has a stakeholder engagement process that Pat described, um, and the board, you know, will continue to receive public comment on this, um, you know, both through our all the time public comment process uh, and through special public comment periods uh, when we've got um, particular issues before the board. On the global payment uh, model side, um, you know, implementation might require use of one or more of our regulatory authorities, and if so, and if we were to need to undertake rulemaking, um, I just want to note how how much uh, granular detail about payment methodologies would be required for that process and how much engagement of board members, um, public presentation, engagement of stakeholders and the public um, would be required to kind of move through that process. So we're looking ahead at um, at a long road of stakeholder engagement uh, and, and board engagement on both of these um, processes and want to make sure that um, we are um, taking time along the way to understand where board members are at, um, understand where the public and, and our stakeholders are at, um, and be able to learn um, learn from kind of all parties involved so that we can, um, you know, design something that makes sense for Vermont and for Vermonters. Um, that is all I have today. Um, I will note that I included a couple of appendix slides here, so if folks are looking for uh, more information on the literature behind global budgets and global payments um, or an overview of the state models that um, Pat mentioned earlier. Those are both in the appendix um, as well as a, a little bit of an update on uh, the Act 167 Section 2 community and provider engagement work as well. All right, thank you. Um, board member question or comment? 
You know, Neil, just I, I had a couple, but I know um, Chair Foster. I know you have a hard stop at four, and I want to. Uh, we have another agenda item, so I just maybe I'll just ask one question, and I'll save the other ones for future conversations around this topic. I think we'll be talking about it quite a bit, but uh, I'm just wondering how will the community engagement work that's outlined in Act 167 both inform and be informed by this global budget design work? Seems like it's really integrated, and uh, I'm just wondering how that's gonna how it's going to work out. That's an excellent question. Thank you. Um, so I think when we think about the payment model work and the community engagement work, um, one of the things that I think we've recognized in our um, current all payer model agreement, and I think it was Pat uh, or perhaps Sarah Lindbergh who said this earlier, um, you know, a payment model, uh, a payment model alone may not be sufficient to transform our healthcare system. So I think of the payment model as one piece of the puzzle. Um, and, and the work that we would do with providers and their communities to think about, you know, what, what does healthcare need to look like to serve that community sufficiently um, and to provide, you know, high quality access to affordable care um, as really dovetailing together um, and kind of making each other possible. I will also note that you know, I, I didn't specifically mention this, but when we think about those adjustments, uh, those annual adjustments, um, you know, to, to the extent that there were, um, you know, that there were transformation initiatives that come out of that community and pro provider engagement work, which I think we hope, uh, we definitely hope that there will be, um, you know, to the extent that there are service line changes or things like that, or new investments or shift of resources, that's something that we would, that we would want to be uh, considering in the global payment and um, global budget setting. Um, so they're, you know, both technical links, but I think more importantly, um, thinking about them conceptually as activities that will complement each other. Yeah, I think it'll be helpful to also understand what are the what are the resources that are going to be needed to actually support that hospital transformation. I mean, there are estimates of the funding that's going to be required, uh, and that will depend in part on how much transformation is happening in, in each community. So it's all going to, I can see it all intertwined. It's some really important work. Thanks for all the work you're doing. Thank you. Um, I don't have any questions at this time, but thank you both very much. And you're doing great work. I know this is a massive lift, so thank you. Um, I'll turn it to public comment. Um, Mr. Hoffman, I see your hands raised. Please go ahead. Uh, I think you're muted. Uh, thank you, Chair Foster. Um, I, I think it's worth pointing out that um, in Cherno's evaluation of the Maryland Alpine model, uh, we don't have anything to suggest that the application of global budgets led to a change in care delivery. Um, similarly, we're finding uh, beyond cap and growth here in rural Pennsylvania. The application of global budgets hasn't succeeded in much else. And there's still quite a bit of debate here about what the value has been. Um, so that's a comment. Um, since the presentation was teed up as um, the emphasis being placed on advancing value-based care as the real goal in this next model. Um, I think despite many attempts to pointedly ask both AHS and this board uh, about what they conceive of as um, a rather vague term and icon they placed on some of their slides called total cost of care accountability framework. Uh, which typically appears as an umbrella at the top of their slide. Um, will anyone please definitively today respond to the public's request to understand is that the current ACO? Uh, comments have been made by both regulators in the past that the new model would be ACO agnostic. 
and yet there's been no enumeration of how uh, the total cost of care accountability framework would be executed absent something that would replace the current ACO framework. Uh, um, and I think the public would really like to know at this point, given that contracts literally would need to start being inked in less than a year, really in starting in the new year, is this going in the direction of the current ACO continuing to be the auspices beneath which that accountability framework will be executed? Uh, I think it's late enough in the day that someone, anyone should let the public know if that's where this is headed. Um, and I think that uh, an absence of a response is also a sufficient answer for many of us. Um, and in light of the letter that, that was sent to the ACO today, using words like recalc recalcitrant, unacceptable, and enumerating the many failures of this ACO, I think it's pretty unthinkable for the public to suspect Bend disbelief that there's no other plan if it is the case that this is your intended vehicle for reform in the next iteration of the all payer model. Um, and then lastly, uh, this, this act that promulgated the work group, uh, and there is a lot of work that was done, um, specified that the public would be part of a robust engagement which to date it's not been. And this board generously permits the public to attend the PCAG meetings and the general advisory meetings. Could you please tell us why you would refuse the public to similarly attend these meetings and to permit public comment? Is there is there discussion or information disseminated in these meetings that are too uh, confidential so as to preclude robust public engagement as was established in statute? And again, a, a response would be lovely, but in the absence of same, I think we'll all infer um, the reluctance of this or to, to answer some of those questions that have been pretty forward any response by the board. Yes. Thank you. Um, Mr. Hoffman, I was having a hard time with some of that. It was breaking up on my end. Um, so I'll try and respond to the pieces that I got. If you'd like to send a, an email or a letter um, with any of it, that might, might be beneficial after this. Um, I heard a question about whether or not the ACO would be the component going forward. And I think Ms. Jones addressed that earlier in the, her presentation. I think the answer was um, that this information is fairly new as to the delay and that we'll be working on all possible um, options and evaluating them um, and that that's being worked on right now with CMMI. And I think the other question was about transparency into the um, global budget process. Um, it's something that we're conscious of and thinking of. I think that what we're doing is having public comment being submitted and we're having hearings and updates about what we're seeing and what we're doing. And the public can comment and participate there as they can in all of our hearings. Um, perhaps that changes as we go forward. There is pretty robust participation from a diverse group of people in those meetings, um, including um, the healthcare advocate, uh, payers, hospitals, non-hospitals. Um, so I hope that answered your question, but I didn't quite catch all of it. But if it's okay, it was meant in statute to be robust community engagement. I see robust executive engagement, um, and I don't see the uh, synopsis of those meetings as 
in any way offering the public a comprehensive view of 120 minutes of dialogue, it's not possible that these are capturing that. And I would just suggest to you that it's a violation of statute. Um, if if this if this board can permit the public to engage in PCAG and the general advisory committee through attending virtually and asking questions, what compelling reason can you offer us today to understand why the why the community has been foreclosed from similarly being engaged? It's in statute. It's supposed to be robust community engagement, not robust insurance executives, hospital executives. Um, the healthcare advocate had to fight to elbow its way into that room. And, and so not even they were permitted early on into that room. Why, why is the community being prevented from being at that table? Um, Ms. Jones, member of Lund or Ms. Kinzer, do you have any additional information we should share at this time? I would, um, you know, I just know that the groups that we put together are advisory um, at this point in time. We're taking their input. You know, we're at a stage in this process where we really don't have a lot of information to share from CMMI. When we do, um, I think that will provide a better opportunity for um, more public engagement. We've shared, you know, what we have today. We'll continue to share that. I will say that we've started to um, engage with advisory groups that um, include a broad range of participants, people with lived experience, um, providers. We've engaged with um, the Department of uh, disabilities, aging, and independent livings advisory board. We will be meeting with the Mental Health Integration Council um, moving forward, and we're really um, gearing up on that um, on the you know more public um, engagement process as we have information to share. Um, unfortunately, at this point, there's not a lot we can share. Um, but when we can, we absolutely will and would welcome feedback on how best to um, to ensure that we get broad participation and feedback. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Walter, I see your hand is raised. Hi, Ellen. Sorry, my camera is still unconscious. I can't wake it up. I just wanted to build on the previous commentary. Um, around the time of 2015, I sat on a Green Mountain Care Board committee for to study prior authorizations. And the only reason I was on there was because prior authorizations nearly killed me. And I was there as a patient to make them look me in the face with everything they said about prior authorizations and I questioned them at all times. And we presented that study to the legislature, of course. My question here, based on that, is when we design all these models, which we always seem to be doing, will a patient be on the panels, a member of the public, a patient, someone who has to go through this, someone who's uninsured, because they can't afford insurance or whatnot, be on one of these panels. That, I'll end it there. That's a good, good question. Is there any information we have on Mr. Carpenter's question at this time? So um, I would again reiterate that we are beginning to engage with advisory groups that include um, people with lived experience and patients, and we'll continue to do so and would welcome input on how best to do that. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Davis. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. 
I, I really got this. This is really a question I've never really understood about uh, global budgets. The real engine of of, uh, of cost increase in, cost uh, increases is essentially um, decisions by physicians to overuse or to underuse or whatever. That that and so the what I'm curious about is does the glo does global budgets does global budgets somehow integrate the what happens to the individual doctor, especially in smaller hospitals and especially orthopedic surgeons. Okay, um, does that does the is the global budget aimed at controlling the hospital side of the cost, or does it include the doctor side of the co the, the cost? That's my question. Yeah, I think we can address. Member Lunch, do you have anything on that? Sure, happy to, unless Sarah prefers to. Yeah, so I think, Ham, you've hit on the reason that the TAG was very interested in seeing professional services included in the payment methodology to align those interests uh, for at least hospital-employed um, physicians and others uh, in both primary care and specialty care um, who order the services. So. I think that's a that wasn't a feature in the other states' global budget models in the past. Uh, but uh, the way that CMMI tackled that in Maryland was to include a primary care model and a total cost of care overlay. So I think from a looking at existing models in the past, there's a couple different ways that you could kind of approach that. You can learn from them and think about adding in more services if we can figure out how to operationalize that. Or you think about combining the global budget with other payment methodologies and a total cost of care like Pat was describing in the portfolio approach. Uh, well, thanks, Rob. I didn't, I didn't fully understand that. If, 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 do we now, are we now talking, when we're talking about a global budget, are we talking about a global budget for the hospital, or are we talking about the, the cost of the hospital plus the doctor? What is that? What, what, is it, what does it mean to you now? You're talking about global budgets. I don't know what global budgets mean. How global are they? So that's the purpose of the work group is to work through that on a very detail oriented code specific level so we can model it. So that's that's really the work that's happening now, Ham. Um, when you look at other Medicare models in existence today, it's been inpatient and outpatient facility claims. I think there's been high interest in Vermont to broaden it to include the professional services claims, but nobody's operationalized that. So that's the work that uh, has to happen. Okay, well, thank you very much for that. Just a comment, the, if, if you wanna control the costs, okay, the hospitals can't raise the money unless the doctors do the service. And the doctors do the service based on a whole bunch of things like their professional skills, they, how much money they want to make, and so forth. So, because the reality is, if you look at Vermont today, you have X and 2X in the amount of money that gets paid to orthopedic surgeons uh, across the system. Uh, check it out. Trust me, it's there. Thank you. Okay, um, I'm going to move to our next topic. Um, so you got to get through this agenda item. Um, Ms. Bowles, are you are you here? Great, and and thank you, Ms. Jones and Director Kinsler. I appreciate your work on this. Um, Ms. Bowles, take it away. Will do. Um, can folks see my screen? Great. Okay. Um, so last item of the day, I'm hoping this can be pretty quick, but we are back here to talk about the Medicare only ACO guidance. Um, in terms of a very quick agenda for today, I will briefly review the performance data section question that we discussed last week, um, and then hand it back to the board for questions and discuss it, discussion, public comment, and the potential vote. Um, so this slide just has the questions that we discussed last week. Um, as a reminder, we were adding some benchmark performance measures uh, and asking 
um, in question seven here, the, a holdover from last year uh, asking whether the ACO benchmarks their performance against similar entities. And then the new question, which is whether the GMCB expects or um, saying that the GMCB expects to require FY24 reporting of Vermont performance data from the ACO as part of their FY24 budget approval. The reporting requirements will be finalized in the ACO's budget approval. Um, and again, that would be in the fall. Um, and the ACO should review the metrics listed in append appendix tab D of performance data and justify any proposed deletions or additions to these metrics. Um, Again, this is just a repeat slide from last week, um, but as a reminder, the way that this um, question or statement in the guidance is worded leaves um, the opportunity for the final metrics to be reviewed and approved by the board as part of the reporting requirements that are set for these Medicare only ACOs in the fall. Um, and that also allows opportunity for us to take into account responses from the ACOs or other public comments on these metric lists. Um, so between last week and today, uh, we wanted to allow, we, we delayed voting last week to allow um, initial public comment from anyone who wanted to submit to us. Um, we, did, we didn't get any um, other public comment besides uh, uh, the blurb I have here from AHS um, because we wanted to check in with them about kind of how these measures connected to other statewide measures. Um, so the initial comment that we got back from AHS, um, I'll just read it here, says um, their initial comment noted that these measures are different from the current state measure sets, but they seem consistent with standard utilization and ambulatory care sensitive condition admission measures. Um, the measures also overlap with areas of interest um, like diabetes, hypertension, COPD, and access to primary care. Um, and that more methodology details would be needed to be able to comment on potential data collection burden for providers. Um, so with, again, with the current guidance, the way that question is written, uh, GMCB can receive input from ACOs in the form of their budget submissions with that question, um, as well as allowing opportunity for other stakeholder um, consideration or, or comments prior to finalizing any of performance metrics in the fall. Um, so with that, we we have suggested motion language here if um, for when we get to that point in the meeting, if folks are ready to vote. But um, for now, I will hand it back to you, Chair Foster, for any board discussion. Thank you very much. Um, members, homes or lunch, do you have any questions or comments? And I'd also be curious if you feel like you're ready to vote. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'll go ahead and jump in um, because I have raised the issue last week. Thank you for allowing for a public comment period and thank you to AHS for weighing in. I'm comfortable voting today. I am as well. Thank you. Uh, I am as well. Um, so, Ms. Bowles, I don't have any other questions. <clears throat> um, I'll turn it to any public comment before we take up uh, a motion. It's throwing people off today because we have two fewer board members and no healthcare advocate. All right, Ms. Bowles, would you mind putting the motion language back up? All right, I will I will move to approve the fiscal year 24 Medicare only ACO budget guidance as presented by staff to the Green Mountain Care Board. I'll second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 And the motion and the guidance is approved. Um, Ms. Bowles, thanks for your great work on this. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think that's all we have on the agenda today. So is there any old business to come before the board? I have some old business that I will just briefly bring up uh, and this will be quick. Um, so I am considering doing a, a proposal related to the Fiscal Year 24 One Care ACO guidance related to ACO performance and the payment methodologies tied to cost and quality, um, but I have don't have that available today. So what I was going to propose is that 
uh, after I've done a little more homework and make a decision that if I'm going to offer something, I will write it up and ask staff to post it by next Wednesday on the ACO budget page so that the public will have an opportunity to see it and provide some input and feedback and public comment, as well as, of course, uh, that my colleagues will have time to react to it and think about it. So I just wanted to mention that uh, so that anyone who's interested will be looking at our website for it next week, potentially. So no promises, but uh, just wanted to announce that. Great, thank you. Anything else? Okay, uh, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All right, thank you everyone and have a good day.